All right, so continuing on with, uh, with enzymes. So once we get enzymes of the proper shape and they, they can go and do their thing, we need to make sure that we can control whether or not they're active or inactive because we always want digestive enzymes in our stomach. So that way whenever we get food, we know they're always there to go and start breaking it down. But we don't always want them working. And we need to be able to turn them off and, and kind of moderate uh, their activities. And one of the, there's two different ways we can do that. And one of the uh, one of the first ways is going to be using the, the oh Dobby guys he has a wand he's not supposed to have a wand we've been over this buddy you keep breaking them he keeps breaking my wands guys well, I'll talk with you later Dobby I got I got a lecture to do you, you're gonna have to ease up for a second all right um, two major ways to turn off an enzyme the first one is competitive inhibition competitive so there's gonna be two things fighting over something inhibition just means to stop it right um, so in this case you have um, an enzyme that has an active site of a certain shape and usually that substrate would fit in that enzyme but your body starts producing inhibitors it's not the substrate but it has the same sh uh, shape to it so it can fit into the active site and if it's in the active site, then the substrate cannot be in the active site. So the enzyme can't do anything to the inhibitor. It's just stuck there. So is the enzyme going to be able to do its job and digest things? No, it's not, right? It can't. It's got something else there. So this is competitive inhibition because these two uh, with the same shape are fighting for the active site. And your body has a way to moderate this. Whenever you um, get low amounts of food in your stomach, some of your cells will start producing inhibitors. Uh, the inhibitors uh, will then start binding into the enzymes and stopping them from digesting food. Uh, when you get a lot of food in your stomach, your, your body stops producing inhibitors. They'll eventually pop out. And when they do, the enzymes can continue on with their job of helping to break the food down. It's just a way to kind of keep, um, keep tabs on how things in our body uh, are working and when they're working. It's a way to say, hey, yeah, work now, and hey, yeah, uh, work later. So it's positive and negative feedback loops, joyousness, right? All right, so that's one type of, of inhibition, is competitive inhibition. So let's look at the other one, and I'm going to get that wand back from you. Don't you break any more of my wands? Yeah, I see you looking at me. It's big old green eyes of yours. That puppy dog look. Guys, don't, don't fall for it. He's not a puppy dog. So the other type of inhibition is called allosteric inhibition. And with allosteric inhibition, um, allosteric simply means to change shape. So rather than block up the active site, we're going to change the shape of the active site. So remember, enzymes are very specific in their shapes. So other than the active site, we have another place on the enzyme called an allosteric site. And so an inhibitor will simply bind to the allosteric site, not the active site, but the allosteric site, the shape changing site. When it does, it causes the protein to change shape and it changes the shape of the active site. So now can the substrate bind to it? Nope, sure can't. So is the enzyme going to be able to do its job? No, it's not. So have we successfully shut it off? Yes, we have. Right? So it's just that simple. So allosteric and competitive inhib inhibitors are two of the big ways we can help control whether or not enzymes are active. And, um, and, and when they're active, how active they are, and all that other fun stuff. And um, that's great, because we don't want to ever have to rely on producing more enzymes as our first go. We need to have them all ready and have them on standby, especially for something like digestion or, um, uh, or several other things, processes in our body that need to happen relatively quickly. All right, Dobby. We're moving on to the next slide. You can come with us? Okay, he's coming with us. Okay, so rate of an enzyme reaction depends on a couple other things as well. So how fast this reaction happens depends on the conditions that are in the environment of the enzyme. Uh, things like temperature and pH and the amount of work to be done. Uh, all of those can affect the rate, how fast the reaction happens. So here's some charts to help us uh, understand and look through that. So let's start off with the temperature and act to Dobby, Dobby. Oh man, this ain't a playground. Dobby, I'm trying to give a lecture. Oh, just go go do something else. I'm sorry, guys. He gets like this every once in a while. You know, at least he's not hitting himself, but still. Breaking my wands, dancing on my playground of, of, of graphs I'm trying to show you. I'm sorry. All right, let's just keep going. Let's just keep going. So, over here we have the temperature. Notice that the enzyme activity is less at lower temperatures and less at higher temperatures. There's an optimal range for them to work. And what happens is 
uh, this is right about 37.5 degrees, which is pretty much right smack on with our body temperature, uh, at least in Celsius. Um, so what happens is when you get too warm, the enzymes denature. They change their shape, and they can't operate. What happens when you get too cold? Well, the same thing. You ever ridden your bike outside when it's cold, and you get to where you're going, and you, you take your hands off the handlebar, and your hands won't move? That's because the enzymes that help your muscle fibers contract, the myosin actin filaments uh, contract, are temperature dependent. If they get too cold, they cannot operate. So that's, that explains that. When they start to warm up, they resume their, their, their proper shape, and then you can start moving your hands. Other things like pH, like in your stomach acids, if your, acid gets, your stomach gets too acidic, um, it can denature the proteins. If your stomach gets too basic, it can denature the, pro the, the proteins, the enzymes, and that will stop them from working. Also, think about how, how many enzymes you have versus how much work there is to do. If you have one person, and I give them a key, and I say, I want you to go around campus and unlock all of the doors, it's going to take that one person a long time because there's a lot of work to do. But what if I gave each of you listening, the entire class, all 30, uh, 28 of you, um, a, a key and said, here, I want you all go to unlock doors on campus. Well, it would take a lot less time because there's a lot more workers. And vice versa, what if I gave everybody a key and said, just go unlock the doors in one building? Well, then it would really happen fast because there's not a, there's a lot of workers, but there's not that much work to be done. So all of those concentrations um, of, of work, concentrations of, of enzymes, all of that can affect uh, the rate at which the reaction happens. So to kind of sum it up a little bit, what do enzymes do for me? Two big things. One, enzymes lower the activation energy, so they make things cheaper. And two, they speed up the reaction, so it makes it faster. Here's a little graph of that. You ever been on a roller coaster before? Yeah, you start off low where you get on the roller coaster, and then it takes you up that big hill all the way to the top, and you know it's going to be a good ride based on how high, high, how high it takes you the first time up, right? And there's that little hump you got to get over to where once you pass that, the, the, the roller coaster is going to happen. That place is called a transition site. It's where you have to you get to stop putting energy into the system um, and the reaction or the system is going to happen at that point forward. You put enough energy into it, it's going to keep going. Um, without an enzyme, it costs a lot of energy to get to that transition site. But with an enzyme, it doesn't cost as much. So that just kind of shows the um, uh, kind of like the, the price save, the, how much energy less you need. Also the times, how long it take us to get down here to the, this bottom state versus here? Well, happens a lot faster with an enzyme. It takes a little bit longer without the enzyme. I think on your exam, one of the things I give you is, you, is this picture with the words deleted and just letters. And I ask, which one of these represents the reaction with an enzyme? Which one without an enzyme? What is the, which one represents the activation energy uh, without an enzyme. How about with an enzyme? So be from be a little familiar with this chart. It's a pretty good one. So one last thing to wrap us up. So um, you, Dob Dobby, oh come on, Dobby, buddy, move out the way, please. Thank you. He just doesn't listen sometimes. You know what? Let's, let's give him a sock. I, th I think he's actually earned his freedom. You've earned your freedom, Dobby. There's your sock, buddy. You are now a free elf. Congratulations. And, and everyone else before you you disappear, just remember, enzymes are not used up in a reaction. They are free to react, to react multiple times. So just like Dobby is a free elf and he's about to vanish, I'm a free person and I'm about to vanish too. And I hope to see you next time. And take care until then.